So let's as well start. So today, basically, we are going to dive into two concepts uh, that build upon the uh, Gaussian processes and Bayesian optimization. So one is the Bayesian inference, and the second is the structured Gaussian processes. So uh, first, uh, as a reminder, in the first lecture, we went through the basics of the Gaussian processes and uh, Bayesian optimization based on the Gaussian processes. So just as the uh, small recap, the Gaussian processes uh, refers to the process of taking several experimental points in whatever parameter space. So it can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, uh, under some conditions, uh, large dimensional. This parameter space can be just a normal scalar value like temperature or time. It can be something considerably more complex. For example, it can be a space of all possible molecules. Once we go from the well-behaved differential spaces to the non-differential spaces, life becomes a little bit uh, difficult. So we are not going to uh, talk about it in detail, uh, but there are ways to work with these uh, spaces. Uh, it just depends how we define the metrics there. So then uh, what the Gaussian process does, it basically tries to reconstruct the function over the full parameter space. And it also tries to give us the uncertainty of this function. So a key to understanding of the Gaussian process is the concept of the kernel. Uh, kernel means only one thing. It means how closely the adjacent points in the parameter space are correlated with each other. So if nothing more, nothing less. So we looked at the kernel priors and the noise priors. So uh, this a choice of this is usually overlooked in the classical uh, Gaussian processing literature. Practically, if you're a physicist, uh, this is the first thing that you need to pay attention for because the priors, both for kernel and the noise, have a very well-defined physical meaning. So for example, the noise prior is our belief in our measurement system. Kernel prior is our belief in uh, how strongly, how strong are the correlations in the parameter space. And we uh, uh, dived in the concept of the posterior. Generally, prior is what we believe before the experiment. Posterior is how the prior knowledge is updated during the experiment. So this is the whole philosophy of the Bayesian inference. And it's also how the science works uh, overall. So we also uh, dived into the concept of the Bayesian optimization, uh, specifically Bayesian optimization based on the Gaussian processes. So uh, the way the Bayesian optimization works is that given the predicted function or also known surrogate model, and given its uncertainty, we need to find out the next promising regions. In a very uh, simplistic way, we can say that we either run our new experiments in the places where we expect the good performance. So this is called the exploitation. We also can run our experiments in the locations when we expect to have a high uncertainty where the good performance may happen. So this is called exploration. Uh, we can focus purely on exploration. So think about it as the fundamental curiosity-driven research we can focus uh, completely on the exploitation. So this is called the greedy policies. The general principle in Bayesian optimization is again, roughly the same as in science in general, if you focus only on one specific goal. So if you are being greedy about your results, you have a very large probability to uh, end up in the local minimum, but not a global minimum. So as you see on this example, if our uh, ground truth function goes like this. This is the true minimum. So you can see that if we were to follow the greedy policy, we would start to explore this minimum and we would end up here. So this is not a true minimum. If we add the exploration in our process, we will probably explore this pro point because it has the highest uncertainty and uh, we would discover the true minimum. So in the experimental setting, how we balance exploration and exploitation depends on what is our experimental budget. If we have only one experiment lined up, so think about it that you have a trip to the SNS or a synchrotron 
and uh, the next one would be only in a year. In this case, you go for the pure exploitation policies. If you run the set of experiment in the lab and you have an option to kind of go back to the experimental design, it's reasonably a good idea to put a lot of effort in the exploration first and then uh, focus on the exploitation. So the way uh, this exploration exploitation balance is uh, realized is through the acquisition function. There are multiple acquisition functions available. So the uh, Bayesian optimization community have developed quite a large stock of them. It is uh, not a problem to define the new ones. It depends what you want to accomplish. But for the simple Gaussian processes, it all goes to the point of uh, ultimately balancing the prediction and uncertainty. So this being said, uh, that there are two set of concepts uh, we are going to explore today. And again, we are going to do it in a very hands-on fashion. The first one is the Bayesian inference. So we are going to uh, see what is the prior distribution for the parameters in the Bayesian inference, what is the posterior, and then we are going to compare it to the least square fits. And then as you can guess, a structured Gaussian process, in some sense, it's a hybrid of the Bayesian inference and the Gaussian processes. So let me stop uh, the PowerPoint here and uh, switch to the uh, notebook. So go to the uh, notebook number two, which is called 2GPAX uh, BIA, uh, which is on the GitHub. So let me share the screen for this one and uh, start with something that uh, all of you uh, have uh, encountered countless number of times, probably starting from the high school. And this something is the least square feet. So uh, what is the least square feet? So it's uh, the most basic tool that we use across virtually all scientific domain. So if you are a physicist, you naturally use least square feet, again, starting from the day one as an undergraduate, again, if not in the uh, not in the high school. So if you are a data scientist, you also will explore the least square fit that is uh, linear fit and uh, logistics regression, which is actually classification and not regression, is an uh, example of it. So the way it works is that imagine that you have some data set, so something. You also have some function. So uh, the function will typically have a set of parameters which we could call theta. So what the least square fit tries to do is to try to find the values of theta in such a way that the function, uh, reconstructed function, y hat, is as close to your data as possible. So this is a very standard problem. Uh, the question becomes, how can you define uh, as close as possible? Typically, it is defined as the mean square deviation. So the uh, uh, average of the difference, square of difference between the predicted value of variables and the data variables. And uh, the nice thing about the least square fit is that it is exceptionally well defined uh, from the point of view of mathematics. So essentially you uh, try to find the minimum of the function L, which is just the difference between your function and your data points at the corresponding points on the parameter space. So we studied it everywhere. There is a, uh, obviously many levels at which least square fit can be explored. You can do it on an elementary basis uh, using the high school program. Uh, you can do it on much more advanced level if you're interested, but most of the time we do it without thinking about it. But uh, let's look at the least square fitting from the perspective of the physicist. So where would the, so since we are not in the high school and we don't take the equation for granted, we need to consider that equation ultimately represents our physical knowledge. So when we fit our equation to the data, we basically do two things at the same time. One is that we uh, try to learn the parameters of our model. So for which values of the parameters, the model is closest to the data. And the uh, second thing that we are trying to do implicitly is uh, figure out whether the model is correct. So notice that even as the case for my first example, example in my first lecture, uh, 
when I show you three dots and say that we can fit it by parabola, we can or we can fit this by the straight line. And ultimately, we make a selection based on our belief in data versus the physics. The same principle works for the uh, least square fit. We have some belief in physics that gives us the analytic expression, and we have some belief in data. And uh, if you lit uh, read the literature from multiple domains, especially something like 30, 40 years ago, when people have done more of it, you can, for example, find a paper where somebody will study the uh, Schottky diet or semiconductor heterostructure, study the transport behavior, fitted by the certain equation, for example, the standard schottky berry model. And then they will say that, look, uh, the data can be fit by the model well, but the resulting parameters are unphysical. For example, you have a very high level of the, the slope is not uh, phi over kt, but something very different. So that basically tells you from the very beginning that the way mathematics and physics interact is a little bit weird. We choose the model and fit them using the purely mathematical tools, but then we take the results and we interpret them using the physicist's viewpoint. And the question becomes, uh, can we do things better? So if you work with the uh, kind of uh, programs like uh, Python, uh, LMFit, or, or Origin, or whatever, you know that the least square fit module actually gives you a little bit of flexibility to define how the fitting procedure happens. For example, you can say that I want my parameters to be non-negative, or I want to impose some sort of constraint on them. But it is really, really very primitive. So uh, before we go further, let's illustrate one more problem with the uh, least square fit. So let's start with the standard fitting libraries. So we use the usual NumPy and Matplotlib. We use the curve fit from SciPy Optimize. So this is just a regular uh, regular uh, least square fitting. By the way, Python has absolutely wonderful LM fit type of models, which are really great to use for the experimental data. And uh, But this one is simple. And let's define a function, which is uh, uh, sort of simple, but inconvenient. So this is a function that is formed by two line segments, and they jump between them. So we choose our values of parameters, we choose a jump point, and uh, we basically create a function that uh, is linear before the jump, then there is a jump, and then it is linear after the jump. So a very simple uh, function. And uh, then, of course, in the spirit of the uh, Gaussian processes, we say that what we measure is this ground truth function plus some noise. So we choose the noise to be 0.1. And uh, this is how this function is going to look like. So the blue line is the ground truth that uh, crosses uh, noisy observations. And you see that there is a very nice jump here. Now let's ask ourselves a question. So can we find this function given the data using the least squeeze square fit model? So let's run the experiment. So uh, I define similar function null form as the fit. So it kind of don't mix this one. This is the data generation function. Uh, this is the fit function. I've chosen it to be the same. So I already make a very big assumption that I know what is the physics of the process. I just want to define the parameters. And then I try to use the least square fit on this function. So the way it is done in the, uh, the way it is done is through this uh, uh, providing the some idea is providing the data and providing some idea of the parameters. And if I do the fit, lo and behold, you can see that uh, the fit is totally different. Now, let's ask a question. Is this fit unreasonable? Absolutely not. If you look at this data, you can speculate that you have a linear segment here and you can see a second linear segment here. Okay, so can I do it better? Of course I can do it better. For example, uh, when I do the least square fit, I need to provide the initial guesses of the parameters. So my quality surface, which determines the difference between the data and prediction, it has a correct minimum, but it also can have a number of the uh, uh, false minima. 
So the idea is that if I get my parameter values close to the right minimum, I will actually get there through the gradient descent. But if I choose the wrong parameter values, I'm not going to get there at all. So anyway, uh, let's try to make my jump point, uh, for example, guess for my jump point to be around two. So what happens in this case? So in this case, I expect the pit fit to be correct, but my parameter values are going to be a little bit off. And uh, that's expected because I really don't know where the jump point is. So what else can I do? So for example, imagine that I uh, change the uh, slope of the one part. How is it going to work in this case? So okay, in this case, it is uh, pretty stable. So what, uh, as it can be expected, uh, I can also experiment with the number of points in my measured function. So for example, here I have chosen 25 points. So let's assume, let's see what happens if I choose 10. So in this case, I have much uh, smaller number of measurements. So if I do the fit, uh, in this case, it converge. Uh, notice one important thing, that it put the jump halfway between the measurement points as the natural guess. So nonetheless, uh, as I illustrated, if we choose our parameter values, initial guess values to be off, we are going to get the numbers which are very far off from the real numbers. And it's very easy to get trapped into the, um, into the metastable minimum. So uh, I made the list of uh, several experiments that you can experiment. So to play with the number of measurement points, play with the initial guesses, but roughly you will find out that if we have a lot of data, of course we can fit uh, well because the behavior of the function is in this case, we have enough data. Uh, however, the fit can depend on the initial parameter guesses and it can easily get to the wrong direction. So the general observation here would be that uh, least square fit is very powerful method. So there is a reason we've been using it for several hundred years. However, it can easily converge to the wrong metastable minimum, even for very simple function. For high dimensional function, it is much easier for that to converge to the long, wrong minimum, and it's also much more difficult to identify it. Uh, and then we have a very limited control of what actually goes in the least square fit. So before it, the parameters can be anything, and uh, if your optimization is convex, meaning that there is a single well-defined minimum and we can get there due to the, uh, by the uh, gradient descent, things work. If not, all the bets are off. And most importantly, as a physicist, we don't have the control over the we don't have the control over the parameter values. And that makes a big difference because very often when I try to make a fit uh, of some data during obtained during the experiment by the model, I have different degree of belief in the parameters. For example, if I have the physical property which is a product of several values, uh, I can trust things like mobility, but for example, I cannot trust the electron concentration that much. And the question becomes, can we introduce this type of uncertainty in the principal manner? And the answer is yes. So we can do it through the Bayesian inference. So uh, in this case, I'm going to show the uh, Bayesian inference done through the GPAX, just for the same reasons as uh, everything else. It's better to stay within the single library. Uh, practically, Bayesian inference can be realized through a very large number of platforms in Python. So outside of GPAX, uh, my favorite is uh, POIMC, uh, but all of them like Pyro, Botorch, uh, uh, pretty much anything you choose will have an option of doing the simple Bayesian inference. So let's see how it is done. So here the, we have the standard import. So we import GPAX, uh, the usual libraries, the only unusual library that we uh, import is going to be the RVs. So RVs is the library that is developed specifically for the visualization of the Bayesian data. Now let's play with that. So as before we start with the defining of the our initial synthetic data. So let's start with the data that has absolutely no noise. So this is our ground truth uh, behavior. This is measured uh, points. Again, we have a 
uh, two linear segments separated by the jump. And now let's do the following thing. So now let's introduce two probabilistic model. So what is a probabilistic model? Probabilistic model is the combination of two parts. One part is the function, function that has the functional form. By the way, we, of course, use the function as an analytical function, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a numerical model, for example. As long as something that can be evaluated fast enough, we can use it as the uh, part of the probabilistic model. But uh, the second part of probabilistic model, uh, which uh, is the way how we uh, inject new knowledge, is the prior values of the parameters. So this is super important. So let's look how it is done for a sigmoidal function. So sigmoidal function, we define four parameters. So this is just a sigmoid curve. And then we say that each of these parameters have the prior distribution. In this case, we have chosen the simplest uh, distribution. This is just the normal distributions. But practically, this is exactly where uh, the uh, where is our opportunity to insert our physical knowledge. So normal distribution means that I really don't know much about the system. So in some sense, it's uh, the distribution with the highest entropy or least amount of knowledge. But practically, if I work with the real physical data and physical curve, this is exactly where I'm going to stop and think, what is the likely value of this parameter? So if I uh, have a mass of an electron as the parameter or the value of the universal gas constant, I probably will make it as a very narrow distribution. I don't expect it to change. If it is uh, something uh, like uh, mobility, well, we know that mobility can be measured roughly plus minus 1%. So I can trust it, remark uh, trust it well. If it is something related to the donor concentration of the system, this is where I need to ask myself, what is the material? If it is semiconductor, yeah, I will trust the donor concentration. If it is the material that has been just grown in the PLD uh, chamber, I really don't know anything about the concentration of dopants there. It can have 3% of oxygen vacancies, or it can have 10% of oxygen vacancies. So this is where the physics come into play. So let's define the second function. So the second function is actually also piecewise function, but now we define it as the also as the probabilistic model. So again, we have the functional form, and we have the uh, priors for the uh, model. Again, I use the open prior. So just to kind of make sure that we know how this distribution look like, we can visualize uh, the uh, distribution. So for example, uniform distribution from one to three will look like this. If you form the histogram, if you want to visualize a different distribution, for example, gamma, it will, uh, work like this. So you will see uh, something different. So this tell, gives us the idea of sort of putting the faces to the distributions. And now let's run the Bayesian inference. So what we do in this case, we start with uh, two objects. One object is our collection of the experimental data. So this is our experimental result. The second is the probabilistic model, meaning the function and priors on the functional parameters. So what the Bayesian inference does, it basically says, hey, given your prior belief of the, on the parameters and given the experimental data you obtained in the experiment, this is how your beliefs should be updated to be consistent with the experiment. So in other words, between uh, before the experiment, you had a large uncertainty. After the experiment, hopefully you can reduce the uncertainty. Uh, by the way, uh, it is not always the case that it is reduced. So you can, if you have the experimental results that are very far away from your original belief, your uncertainty will actually initially grow, not decrease. That's actually one very interesting thing about the Bayesian inference. So now let's run it. So the way we run it is we specify our model we specify our model prior, and uh, then we basically tell the GPAX to run the model with the model and priors and perform the fit operation. So notice that uh, uh, for GPAX, as well for any other good uh, 
uh, Python package, uh, the real job is done under the hood. You just need to provide the uh, inputs to the model and then the work is going to be done for you. So once you uh, look at this, uh, basically there are only two uh, lines of code here. One is you specify the model. So this is a probabilistic model in terms of model and prior. And secondly, you say that you have the model, you want to fit it. Uh, and as an argument, you provide the measured uh, X values. So this is your uh, points where you perform the measurement. This is your Y measured. So this is the values of the function. And then you provide the three, uh, several parameters relevant to how the uh, Bayesian inference works. So first is the warm up. So warm up is the warm up of the Monte Carlo chain. This is the number of samples in the Monte Carlo chain. And this is the number of chains. So there are some interesting ways to uh, make the Bayesian inference uh, perform poorly. I will illustrate how you can kind of uh, mislead it and uh, do the rapid diagnostics of the process. So once uh, the Bayesian uh, inference ran, you get uh, a list of the outputs. And the outputs are the values of your function. So beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4, sigma, and t. So what are these? These look like numbers. And uh, the least square fit would also give us numbers. But these numbers have a slightly different meaning. So remember that Bayesian inference does not give us a single number as an outcome. It gives us a posterior distribution. So this number is the mean of this distribution. This number is the standard deviation of this distribution. This is a median. And uh, these are the parameters that are related to how much we can actually trust it. So, uh, so far, you can ask a question, OK, what's the difference? So in one case, we have one fit. In this case, we uh, have the posterior distribution. What's the advantage? Like, what did we really get out of that? Well, uh, let's uh, look a little bit under the hood. So this is uh, how the Bayesian inference made the prediction. Notice that unlike the least square fit that essentially gave us only one fit value, which corresponds to this uh, minimum of the uh, loss function, the Bayesian inference basically gave us that our behavior can go like this, like this, like this, and like this. So these are called the uh, posterior uh, functions. So they basically show all the ways that this function can behave. So uh, this is just uh, kind of 15 of them. So this is all of them. This is just 15. And uh, then what I can do is I can also, if I have this predicted function, I can also calculate their distribution, which is the predictive uncertainty. So look what happened. Given the, uh, given the data, so this is a measurement and process, our ground truth goes like this. There is no way in the world we can predict where is the jump between these points and this point. We just have no information whatsoever. When we start to do the Bayesian inference, we postulate that we know the shape of the ground truth curve, its functional form. So we're kind of comparing apples to apples. And then what Bayesian inference basically tells us is that the jump can be anywhere from this point to this point. And this is the uncertainty in our prediction. Notice that I mentioned in the beginning that we can run the Bayesian optimization using Gaussian processes, but not necessarily. So in fact, we can actually use this approach to run the Bayesian optimization as well. We will just take this predictive uncertainty as opposed to the Gaussian process predictive uncertainty. There are reasons why it may be not such a good idea in many cases, but you can easily imagine that there can be cases when it will work. We can do the second thing. We can actually try to visualize the uh, posterior distribution of the parameters. And the way we are doing it is actually using the RVs. So it actually simply has the function that allows us to do that. And uh, what you see here is uh, our possible values of the functional parameters. So the one uh, that you can visualize them as the uh, simple distributions. And uh, you can visualize them as the joint distribution. So these are the symbol distributions. For example, for the parameter t, which is the position 
of the jump, you have almost uniform distribution from uh, 1.5 to 2.4, which kind of makes sense because uh, this is exactly the interval which we, uh, where we don't have the data points. For all other parameters, for example, the uh, distributions of betas, which are slope, we have the distribution which looks like uh, almost like this. So for example, this is uh, clearly a, a Gaussian distribution. So uh, we can learn something by about the parameter dependence if we look at these joint distributions. For example, in this case, parameters don't really care about each other. So this distribution is marginalizable. It can be represented as the product of the uh, marginal distributions, meaning projection on both axes. Uh, this one is not, so these parameters would be actually dependent on each other. So that's great. Uh, let's experiment with this a little bit. So let's assume that our data is a little bit more noisy. So rather than starting with the nice curve where everything is simple, uh, we uh, make the same curve, but uh, now we introduce a considerable noise in the system. So if we do that, our measure data, oops, what have I done? Ah, right, because this is added to the ground truth. Let me add it to the right place. So now this is the data. And uh, in this case, you can argue that, uh, look, if I ask you whether you should fit this data by the straight line or by uh, this type of curve with the jump, you can tell me that, you know what, if I have access only to the data, I would probably fit it by the straight uh, light only. Imagine that the ground truth curve is not here. You can just say that, look, it has to be the straight line. It would be really not a good experimental, uh, not a good physical practice to fit it by anything other than the straight line. And then you can say that, look, but I'm collaborating with this guy in uh, uh, some theory division somewhere who is absolutely certain that for this physical system, the response should go like this. So uh, based on my prior physical knowledge, I am fully justified using this functional form. And then the question becomes, uh, how can I fit this type of curve to this type of data? So I guess what, that's exactly what the Gaussian process, uh, sorry, what Bayesian and parents can actually do remarkably well. So if we run the fit process and uh, uh, so in this case, it may take a little bit longer. So let's see how it goes. Uh, and then we visualize all the related parameters. Let's see what happens. So let me uh, run all the relevant cells. Lo and behold, uh, we get our uh, ground truth. We get our sample predictions, which are remarkably noisy because we add noise in this case. And we get our uh, predictive means. So predictive means that uh, why does it look this way? It looks this way because in this uh, case, our algorithm was not able to establish where the jumps are. In fact, if we look at some of the uh, you know, posterior functions, you can see that some of them have the jump roughly where we think it would be, uh, it should be, where we know that where it should be. But it also says that you know what your data can also be consistent with the um, with the jump positioned over here. In some sense, we can get a little bit of a taste of this behavior if we do the least square fits with the multiple initial points. But the problem is that uh, in that case, we will not know how to weight the possible behaviors. So how do we uh, ascribe them the probability? Uh, the Bayesian inference fit actually does it for us. And it basically tells us that this is our fitted function and uh, this is our uncertainty. So we really shouldn't trust it that much, but at least we have some ideas about the parameter values. And we also can analyze the posterior distributions because uh, now it actually tells us 
what the parameters values can be. You can say that, okay, these distributions are very broad, but uh, again, our data was very noisy, so we probably shouldn't expect anything else. We can try to uh, make the noise a little bit smaller. So rather than making it 0.2, let's just make it point, uh, point, uh, point 0.5. Let's make it 0.2. So in this case, uh, the noise is still very, very measurable. But at the same time, you kind of can see that you can sort of speculate that there are two segments here. And then if you do the fit, uh, you will see that, let's see what will happen. Okay, here we go. So in this case, you can see that our models are actually much better behaved. So we were able to reconstruct almost the correct uh, behavior of the system. And now you can sort of see that uh, our predictive uncertainty, it is, uh, has one value here. So this is basically the noise due to the data. It has slightly different value here because uh, it's higher because the algorithm does know where the jump is. And again, we have a very nice uh, posterior distribution of the parameter that tells us what goes on. Now, the question becomes, can we do it even better? So imagine that uh, uh, in order to do this analysis, it is enough to have uh, some of our colleagues, whom we, of course, have to be uh, absolutely trust. So we put uh, probability one on the fact that this function form is correct. We just don't know the parameters. Now imagine that we talk to our colleague and he tells us, you know what, I made the next round of the development of the theory. And from now on, I can not only tell you the functional form, but I can actually be fairly certain about the values of the parameters. And the way you incorporate this uh, knowledge is uh, by saying that, you know what, uh, I have a very good idea that the distribution of the parameter beta, for example, or parameter, uh, or let's choose the parameter t, t which is our uh, position of the jump function. You know what, I think that I know where it is. So, and the way that you represent where it is is through the uniform distribution, but uh, originally it was from zero to four. So zero to four means that the jump can be anywhere, but imagine that he tells us that the jump should be somewhere between two and 2.5. Two so let's introduce this. So make this two, make this 2.5. Let's write the analysis and uh, see what is going to happen. Questions? Oh, okay. So notice what happened. So in this case, I provided the prior values on the position of the jump. Interestingly enough, you can see that even though I don't have any data points here, my uh, functions start to go like this only at the point two. So the reason why it happened is basically I have introduced the prior knowledge to the system and this prior knowledge have overruled my uh, the behavior of the data. And uh, then you can see that if I uh, look at the uh, posterior mean and model uncertainty, all of them are indicate that I have uh, this prior knowledge on where the jump can be. And of course, I can also do that even for uh, I can also do that even for uh, slopes and so on and so forth. So you can experiment with that. Now, the interesting thing about this injection of prior knowledge is that the system becomes much more robust with respect to the fit. So imagine that uh, I go back and uh, I actually increase my noise back to 0 0.5. So as you remember, when I made the noise uh, 0 0.5 first time, things actually stopped working. Okay. Another algorithm running. Interrupt execution. I'm going to come here. So uh, if I have the uh, noise level to 0 0.5, then the Bayesian fit didn't work remarkably, didn't work particularly well. So let's see what happens if we try to run the experiment with the same high noise, but now we 
introduce much more limiting constraint on the position of the jump. And lo and behold, you can see that the fit actually behaved much better. So there are some uh, weird fits. So it, the algorithm thinks that even this type of function can uh, represent our data. But you can see that the uh, jump is localized where we told it to be. And in fact, the fit start to look much more robust with respect to the, if you compare it to the ground truth behavior. So what is the danger of this approach? The danger of this approach that once we introduce the priors on the parameter values, we essentially uh, apply the prior knowledge. If this prior knowledge is correct, uh, it allows the fit to be much faster and much more efficient. If this prior knowledge is incorrect, things are going to work uh, very poorly. So as an example, let's do uh, an experiment where I tell the algorithm that I believe that the jump should be between 0 0.5 and 1.5, which is not true because it actually has to be between the, um, it has to be between the, at 2.1. And let's run the algorithm once once again. Run after. Let's see what happens. Second, let's go back to this part of the code. Here we go. So in this case, uh, we have the uh, data with relatively low noise level. We create the prior distribution on the uh, parameters, which are sufficiently broad, but we introduce a very a constraint uh, to the prior on the position of the jump. So we basically say that we know that it has to be in the wrong place. And then we try to do the fit in this condition. So look what happens. So in this case, the algorithm is absolutely certain that the jump should be here, but uh, in fact, it is wrong. And uh, the problem with the uh, Bayesian inference methods is that uh, that's exactly the limitation with them. If you add the prior knowledge to the system, it makes fit better. Typically, it is slightly better, not a lot, but uh, in many cases, this is enough. If you come up with the prior knowledge that ends up being wrong, and of course you don't know that, then it will throw your algorithm off completely. It will come up with the totally crazy answers. Sometimes it is possible to diagnose it. For example, in this case, you can clearly see that I introduced a fairly narrow set of parameters, uh, distribution and mm, jump position. And you see that this distribution really sits on the edge of the interval. So that tells me that my uh, constraint was wrong. But most of the time for the real uh, experimental problems, you are not going to be able to have such convenient criteria. So in other words, be careful when you choose the prior distributions. They have to be uh, uh, sufficiently narrow to be valuable and to inject the new physics into the system. But at the same time, they have to be uh, uh, sufficiently broad to kind of represent your true uncertainty about the system. If you are very confident of something and this something is wrong, you generally cannot do science this way. So let's run it one more time when I uh, put it even more off. So for example, for 0.7, and uh, I add more points to uh, our experiment. So let's say add uh, 25 points. and uh, Let's see what happens in this case. So as you can see, the uh, fit tries to do as well as it can, but clearly it cannot work very well. The algorithm tells you that uh, the answers are not particularly good because you see a very significant uh, model uncertainty. Uh, 
So basically, you force the model to you the false force algorithm to use this model, but the high uncertainty tells you that maybe this is not the right uh, uh, right selection. So this uncertainty is exceptionally important because in one of the next lectures, in fact, next week, we are going to talk about the hypothesis learning, which is the type of automated experiment that allows you to use this uncertainty in order to uh, get uh, the best strategy to navigate the automated experiment. Now, the last thing that I wanted to say about the Bayesian fit is uh, what if we have more than one model? So for example, we can have a data, but we can have linear model, we have uh, uh, another linear model, we have a power law model, we can have exponential model, we can have the sigmoidal model, we have the piecewise model. So how are we going to compare that? So it turns out that we can actually do that using the Bayesian approach. So uh, the way it is done is uh, very straightforward. We fit our data using all models that we can think about. Uh, we get the values of the parameters. And then you can say, okay, how are we going to compare them? Because each model comes with the parameter values. We know that function with the three parameters can generally fit better than the function with the two parameters. So what do we do? So there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, practically, the easy way of doing it is using uh, through so-called widely applicable information criteria, WAG, where we basically take the results of the fits by all three models, meaning the Monte Carlo traces, send it to the algorithm, and uh, conveniently there is a function in RVs which allows us to do that. And it basically allows us to rank the models based on how likely they are. So for this particular data set, it turns out that piecewise model uh, has rank zero, meaning everything in Python starts with zero. And the sigmoidal model is second best, and the power law models, exponential model are much less likely. And then we can do the same type of uh, magic. So we can feed the data with the uh, with the piecewise linear model and see how the fits look like. We can uh, uh, do the fit with the second base model, which is the sigmoidal, and see how the fit look like. And then generally, based on the value of the SWI criterion and uh, on the uh, behavior of the results, we can choose which model is correct. Uh, notice that in this case, we don't ascribe the prior probability to the models. But we can also do that as well. So then it becomes a little bit more complicated. So let's make a pause here. And uh, I would be happy to take questions, if any. So if uh, no questions, then uh, let's go to the second part of the presentation, which is the structured uh, uh, Gaussian models. So let me switch to the uh, back to the PowerPoint screen. So. Uh, in the first uh, lecture, we talked about the uh, general Gaussian processes, and there were several key things that I mentioned at that time. So one was that uh, they work only in the low dimensional spaces. So the correlations are defined by the kernel function, which in some conditions can be limited. And most importantly, we don't have any knowledge about the physics of the system. The second thing is that we typically don't use cheap information that is available during the experiment. So over the last uh, two or three years, uh, Maxim uh, and I worked primarily on getting over this limitation in uh, uh, GP. And uh, once these algorithms are developed, applying them to the real world problems. So the structured Gaussian process is how you use the knowledge about the physics of the system. And based on the fact that uh, we talk about it right after talking about the Bayesian inference, you can conclude that this is how GP and the Bayesian inference are coming together. So just to look a little bit under the hood, 
So uh, in the terms of the formal definition, the Gaussian process is simply the multivariate normal distribution, which is uh, uh, defined by the kernel function. Very often kernel function is the uh, simply Gaussian, the RBF can be matter and it can be something else. And uh, th these are the parameters of the kernel function. So these are there's some distributions in turn. However, if you take uh, virtually any textbook about the Gaussian processes, somewhere very close to the introduction, that would be a magic uh, phrase. We define the Gaussian processes this way. We take the mean function to be zero. And the reason why we take the mean function to be zero is because it is domain specific. And uh, in a good book, uh, for example, Garnet is really a great one. They will show you how the Gaussian process depends on the choice of the mean function, just to kind of as an illustration, but that would be it. There is usually no discussion of how uh, the mean function can be constructed. Just make it zero. After that, uh, the Typical textbook will go all the way into discussion of how you construct the kernels, how the algebras can be created on the kernels, what do you do with the kernels over the high dimensional spaces, uh, how do you analyze the significance of features dependent on the kernel behavior. I mean, it becomes really interesting and really powerful. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about it primarily because the, there are books that uh, already do it exceptionally well and reading them is... Uh, probably much more interesting than uh, spending uh, two hours in front of the computer screen. However, the uh, part related to the mean function is not a part of the typical textbooks. So one of the things that uh, Maxim has developed was to develop the GPAX code towards the addition of this mean function. So he went through the corresponding derivation of coding uh, currently, to the best of my knowledge, in uh, commercial uh, tools like Botorch, you can add the mean function. But uh, again, to the best of my knowledge, you can add the mean function only with the way to determine the parameter as the least square, so not a fully parametric model. I expect that very soon there would be a fully parametric implementation, but when it happens, it happens. Uh, until then, this is the only, uh, this is the primary game in town. So, how would the uh, Gaussian process augmented by the probabilistic model look like? The answer is very simple. So, the uh, normal Gaussian process has the mean zero, so the mean function goes like this, and uh, our prior predictive distributions basically reflect how the function can change around the zero. So that's something that we've seen several times in the first lecture and in the notebooks. In the structured Gaussian model, the mean function is a probabilistic model. It's exactly the same type of model that we just looked at in the context of the Bayesian inference, but it's put as the mean function in the Gaussian process. And that's the beauty of it, because Gaussian process gives us flexibility, whereas the mean function allows you to add the knowledge of physics. And uh, the principle here is exactly the same. So I can choose my probabilistic model as simply something that has two peaks. So I can uh, uh, choose the offset, and I can say that offset can change from minus 10 to 10. I can say that the peaks have the Lorentzian shape. And I have certain distribution for the areas of the peaks, for their widths, and for their position. And now this becomes insanely powerful because this is how you represent the prior knowledge of physics. For example, if you talk about something like a lattice model or you want to explore the statistical physics, very often we don't know where is the phase transition. But we know how the... Uh, asymptotic behavior for high temperatures and low temperatures look like. If you look at the history of physics, for example, like Ising models, the behavior away from phase transition was explored uh, long before the full Ansager solution was obtained. For many models, we actually don't have the analytical form of the canonical sum and so on and so forth. So we don't have uh, analytical solutions. But for many models, we know the asymptotics we typically know the behavior 
of the system close to the phase transition. So in many cases, we know that it has to be a power loss. We just don't know what the power is. So scaling coefficient can be unknown. And we don't know exactly the uh, phase transition temperature. We also know that in some cases, you know, if you do the lattice model, the phase transition temperature can depend on uh, the size of your model. So the great thing about the structured Gaussian processes is that they allow you to take this prior physical knowledge and make it as a part of the active learning experiment. Because now you add the prior physics knowledge and that really constrains how long it will take you to discover the true behavior in the active learning process. Let me show you a very simple example. So uh, in fact, we are going to do it in the collab, but just let's uh, look at the visualization. So this is the acquisition function. Uh, this is the uh, Gaussian process discovery. So the black line is the true function. The red line is the Gaussian uh, process reconstruction. So the crosses are the seed points, so our initial measurements. And uh, the round uh, points is our experimental steps. So let's see how the uh, Gaussian process, uh, notice that in this case, we've chosen the uh, ground truth function with the jump. So think about it, the system has a phase transition. So look how the Gaussian process behaves. It tries to find the shape of the curve and do the measurements, but it cannot quite fit the jump. It cannot, for the very simple reason that here the function is smooth. So the correlation length is actually large. Here, the correlation length is very, very short. However, our kernel cannot decide whether it has to be a large kernel length or whether it has to be short. It's kind of a conundrum. So basically, it's going to spend all the experimental budget trying to check the behavior of the function away of the jump and close to the jump. So there is a principle that the Gaussian process will always converge. So if we give enough time and a significant experimental budget, we will actually reconstruct the function. But essentially, the width of the jump would be the same as the distance between the sampling points everywhere in the parameter space. So now think if we try to do this in not in the one-dimensional case, but in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional or four-dimensional cases. We simply will run out of the measurement points very, very rapidly because we know that we need automated experiment because we cannot sample everything on the grid or even using something like Sobel spacing or whatever. It is too inefficient. Experiment is finite. However, if we have the anything that resembles an interesting physics, meaning a single line of phase transition, we need roughly the same number of the points for Gaussian processes as we do for the grid search. It's really not worth it. So let's see if a uh, structured Gaussian process makes a difference. So in case of the structured Gaussian process, we say that our prior function can be anything, but it has just one jump. Look what a difference it makes. The algorithm spends first steps of the experiment to localize the position of the jump. And then it basically at leisure spends the rest of the experimental budget to just refine the behavior of the tails. And uh, what is really cool is that, that this uh, behavior, uh, it actually scales to the higher dimensions. So, uh, this is a relatively a dense image. Let me sort of unpack it step by step. So what you see here as a background is the ground truth magnetization of Ising model with the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor inter uh, interaction. So this is the ferromagnetic phase, high magnetization. This is anti-ferromagnetic phase. Uh, this is the frustrated phase when the ordering imposed by nearest neighbors and near, next nearest neighbors interactions are opposite. So the zero, zero point is the high temperature region. So these are the paramagnetic phases. Notice that the boundaries are kind of not straight because this is a toy model, but anyway, it gives you an idea of uh, the very familiar physics. Let's assume that I want to explore this parameter space using the simple Gaussian processes in the purely exploratory mode. So I don't try to find the maximum of magnetization. 
I just try to explore the phase diagram towards the minimization of uncertainty. So as predicted, Gaussian process will uh, take the measurements more or less uniformly in the parameter space. And uh, here you see the reconstruction. So reconstruction is actually nothing to write home about. So it's actually very poor. You can see that uh, we, of course, found the region where there is a high magnetization correctly. So not a surprise. The transition regions are very broad. And uh, generally, I mean, we didn't spend that much uh, points. So our experimental budget is only 30 points for two-dimensional phase diagram. But I would say that this is really not worth it because we try to explore this model as the completely black box solution. Let's see what the structured Gaussian process does. So here we choose the probabilistic model that is uh, very simple. We just say that uh, there is a region with the high magnetization. There are regions with the zero magnetization. The boundary between these regions is going to be the tangent H curve. And the shape of this boundary in the parameter space is some uh, third degree polynomial. Very, very, uh, uh, very, very generic conditions. And uh, that being said, they're very generic, but that's uh, how, the, uh, how the human scientists will think. And we also can estimate, so we don't know what happens in this part of the phase diagram, but we can estimate very well what happens in the zero temperature limit. So the fact that there is a single magnetic phase is something that we can establish based on the simple analysis. Look how the structured Gaussian process works in this case. So the algorithm spent a little bit of time exploring the parameter space. It very quickly discovered by the initial points that uh, we have uh, zero magnetization here, here, and here. We have magnetization Y here and here. And then the algorithm basically spends all the experimental budget exploring the boundary between the ferromagnetic and the non-ferromagnetic phases. And the reason why I did it is because that's exactly what we told it to do. So uh, are there limitations of this approach? Absolutely. If you compare the ground truth, you can see that uh, there is some magnetization in the uh, paramagnetic phases, given how our, our algorithm chose. So none of this behavior was captured by the SGP. Why? Because that was not a part of our model. If we come up with some preconceived notion about what is that that we want to find, it is much easier for us to find it. However, it also brings a risk of not uh, discovering the things that were not a part of the original model. So, well, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It sort of applies for humans as well. If we have a preconceived notion, we tend to see this answer everywhere. So this being said, uh, let's see how, uh, uh, how it uh, looks in the real, uh, real world setting. So if you don't mind going for the, uh, for the third uh, notebook, which is called the 3GPAX SGPA, which is in the same, uh, which is in the same uh, folder on the GitHub. You will see the illustration of the structure Gaussian process, uh, uh, structure Gaussian process. So uh, we just discussed how it works. Uh, the installations here are exactly the same. So we go through the same uh, GPAX, uh, uh, NumPy, uh, sorry, NumPy, Matplotlib, NumPy, and RVs. And uh, at the beginning of the notebook is kind of already familiar. We just start with defining some um, function. So in this case, it is the function that let's kind of, let's make it a little bit more interesting than just uh, linear. Let's make it uh, two uh, power law segments. So one is x power, x power b to one, then there is a jump, then there is a x power, uh, power b to two. So we define the number of the initial observation points. We define the noise level. We define the values of the parameters, so including the position of the jump, including the first power, including the second power. 
As usual, we introduce the seed so that our numerical experiments are reproducible. Uh, we choose some points to do the measurements, so we just pick them uh, randomly. Uh, and then we basically calculate our function and then we visualize it. So very familiar, nothing unusual here. So let's uh, first try to fit this function with the standard Gaussian process. So uh, kind of, we, again, we define our Gaussian process. Uh, it's a good idea to explicitly define the noise prior. So this is what we know about the noise in the system. It's a good idea to define the uh, Gaussian process kernel priors. So again, uh, remember that priors matter. In this case, we choose the distribution that are sufficiently broad, but that just makes it convenient. We can visualize our distribution. Everything is fine. Let's run the Gaussian process. So while it is going, just uh, again, go through the code. By now, you should be able to read it. So we define the uh, random keys just the way the uh, Jax wants it. We define our Gaussian process model. So notice that uh, format is universal. So our model uh, defines the kernel, dimensionality, kernel, uh, kernel priors, noise priors. That's it. Then we fit the model given x, y. Uh, let's kind of stay with one chain for the time being. Then we get the prediction of the model. Then we plot the results. And uh, as you can see, the results are kind of absolutely not what we want to have. So the Gaussian process tried to do the best it could given the experimental measurements. So it faithfully fit this part of the process. It tried to make a, a reasonable extrapolation given the points that we had, but notice uh, where it went wrong. So first of all, it cannot really describe this jump. It has, it's simply not a part of the it's not a part of our model. Uh, another thing is that it start to predict that the function is going to do go down here. Why? Because it learned based on the correlation that first you go up, then you go down. So if you go up again, the you expect that it will be a, a correlation will actually force it to go down. We can actually uh, experiment uh, further with that. So let's assume. Let's see what happens if we. Uh, take more experimental points in this case. So uh, once we define uh, the number of the experimental points, let's say that we want to have uh, uh, 55 experimental points. So now it behaves much, looks much better. So let's try to do, run exactly the same experiment and see what happens. So it will take some time for the Monte Carlo to converge. So as you can imagine, the more the points, the longer the calculation take because the size of the uh, kernel matrix is equal to the number of points. Uh, look what happened in this case. So uh, the fit is almost perfect everywhere where we have enough the data. But in this region, it actually tried to uh, basically sort of make the smooth interpolation. And to be honest, if we didn't know that the function has a jump, that's uh, exactly what the human scientist uh, would have done. So again, the principle is that if you have uh, if you have enough data and you, the data is reliable, that it really doesn't matter how all of your physics is going to work. Uh, we can try to increase our noise level. So if we uh, Let's see what happens if the noise is uh, one rather than uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, zero point uh, one. So let's run the same experiment again and uh, see what happens. Very convenient thing about uh, shows with the. Uh, 
uh, collabs, unlike the uh, normal lectures, is that they make a natural pause for pause for drinking coffee during the presentation. Of course, it's very important to time it to know how long some sort of calculation takes. So it is a uh, twenty second, but not uh, uh, not ten minutes. Which is actually also difficult because the collabs start to have the different uh, level of resources available to them. But anyway, so let's see what happens in this case. So it turns out that uh, our Gaussian process have actually failed rather miserably. So the algorithm did not know how to deal with the fact that we have this large jump. So basically it failed in the way that you've seen in the first lecture. It basically declared the uh, kernel lengths to be very, very small. So it basically interprets each small peak as the individual observation. So the correlations are small. Therefore, it said that uh, the measurements are zero everywhere outside of the proximity to the measurement points. And also notice that in this case, we got a, a very clean uh, illustration of why of uh, the fact that our mean function is zero. So you can see that the kernel length is uh, 0 0.01. So here we don't have many points. So it is uh, in this region, the algorithm thinks that there is no information from the adjacent points, which basically means that it defaulted to the zero value. So kind of pretty good explanation of how it works. So let's... Uh, try to see whether it will work with the structured process. And uh, again, we are essentially circling back to the concept that we discussed about the Bayesian inference. Let's now, rather than mean function being zero, let's take the mean function to be uh, some, fun some probabilistic function. So you can choose the piecewise version. We can choose the second piecewise version. So this one has the right form is, uh, x power beta one, x power beta two. The second one is different. So this is uh, just, uh, 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 this is just a linear segment before and linear segment after. We define the priors for this function. Again, as we discussed, priors are exceptionally important. And then we run the uh, Bayesian fit of this data. Let's see how it is going to work. So notice that in this case, I have uh, defined the relatively short, uh, relatively uh, short uh, chain. So only 200 uh, samples for warm up and 400 samples for a run. So typically, it's a good idea to set several uh, thousands. And uh, also, there are ways to monitor whether the chain is converged or not. So once the algorithm runs and gives you some monitoring observations, which essentially tell you the number of divergences in the Monte Carlo chain. Uh, so, uh, so, so basically like this is a, a still like a fitting problem, right? Like we are not predicting what's in the like next point to mayor, right? With the BO. Uh, we will get to this point. Oh, okay. So, so uh, I'm going through this uh, relatively slowly because again, first of all, I'm trying to condense something that uh, took about three years to learn into essentially seven lectures. Second, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, secondly, notice that there are, uh, again, uh, Bayesian inference normally would be taught in a very different part of the mathematics courses uh, or, or statistics than the Gaussian processes. So, for example, I learned Bayesian fits when I was... Uh, uh, second year undergraduate back in Russia. I've never, uh, I never studied Gaussian processes until uh, four years ago. So, however, there are some things which are common about them, which is this whole concept of the balance of uncertainties and prediction with uncertainty that come back together once you start to use them in the physics concept. So, what we are trying to do is to first uh, approach this uh, active learning process from the pure data-driven perspective. That one is the least familiar for physicists, so it takes a little bit, uh, probably the biggest jump of imagination. 
Secondly, we try to approach it from the perspective of the uh, structure of the Bayesian inference. That one can be more familiar because it is reminiscent of the least square fit that all of us know, but it's not exactly least square fit. So there are fundamental differences. And the problem is that it is very important to look at these differences early on because this is these differences on which we build upon in order to get to the structured Gaussian processes and then they be all based on structured Gaussian processes. So very good question. And uh, kind of now we get to the point when the calculation almost converged and let's see what we get. Here we go. So we get the values for beta, we get the values for the length scale, and we get the value of the fit. So notice the difference. Uh, here, Gaussian process uh, clearly failed. It didn't work particularly well. It declared that, hey, your data is too noisy. Uh, I think that the correlation uh, from point to point are very short range. I refuse to predict what is going to happen in this location. In this case, we said that uh, we are now giving you the structural model. And yes, the data can be fairly high. Uh, the noise can be fairly high. Look what happened. So now we have the, uh, now we have the prediction and we also have the uh, kind of uh, sample, sample predictions. And you can see that they all look like the right functional form as they should. Uh, the only thing that the algorithm is not certain about is the position of the jump. And of course, it's not certain about the positions of the jump because there are simply no points. So the jump can be anywhere here. And uh, interestingly, you can see uh, how beautiful, or in this case, it's beautiful because it makes sense, uh, how beautiful is the behavior of the uh, sample predictions. So the jump can be here or jump can be here and then and kind of goes all the way to the point where we actually did the measurement and we know that there cannot be any jump after this point. We, of course, can uh, use the same type of uh, logic to calculate the uncertainty. And uh, then we will be able to uh, use this uncertainty to actually predict how the, uh, to run our active learning process. So let's uh, wait for one more minute until uh, the process uh, happens for the second model. So notice that we uh, run it for both models. So we choose first piecewise, second piecewise. We choose their priors. And then we run for, uh, we zip, zip them together. And then we sort of run the cycle, this exploration cycle for both models in order to compare the results. So we are two thirds of the way through. That's actually the primary difference between the uh, Botorch and everything else, because uh, uh, GPAX is designed to specifically to work on the type of problems that are practically important for experimentalists, meaning something that is light, low dimensional, and rich in physics. So Botorch uh, is developed as the production code. So in principle, you can scale it, run it on the supercomputer or on the multiple gravitons at the same time, and it will scale. So sort of the example of the packages that are developed with the totally different uh, uh, goals in mind. So we are getting here. And here we go. So this is our uh, feed by the second function. So in this case, uh, see what happens. So this is actually the most uh, interesting thing about the structural uh, Gaussian models, which can be both good and bad, is that it actually, if your function known partially, it will still work much better than the normal Gaussian process. So what happened in this case is that the function tried to uh, fit 
the data with the two linear segments with the jump between them and uh, see what happened. So it decided that the jump is somewhere here. So this jump is the part of our structure model. But at the same time, notice that its behavior around the true jump is actually much better than it was the case for the uh, that it was the case for the simple Gaussian process. This one simply failed. This one actually made an effort to describe the behavior around the jump correctly. So it is much more robust. And uh, imagine that you don't have the ground truth behavior. You just told that there should be a jump somewhere. Notice that it discovered the wrong jump, but it uh, actually did a pretty decent job interpolating this jump through the uh, Gaussian process part. And this is the strength of the structure Gaussian processes, because if we try to analyze this function by the Bayesian parents, uh, it is too rigid. So least square fit will fail. Simple Bayesian inference would be too rigid for that. It will not be able to describe this behavior. It would be simply a part of the kind of, it will simply make the posteriors too broad. Gaussian process is too flexible. It uh, will, in this scenario, it would fit any small noise peak as real. Structured Gaussian process is uh, essentially in the Goldilocks zone. It's just right. And more importantly, that this is a gift that keeps on giving because if we uh, tell uh, if we know something about the position of the peak, so if I choose the prior to be uh, from 1.5 to 1.7, it will actually find the peak, uh, it will actually find the position of the jump correctly. So that's an example when uh, knowing more is actually a good idea. So let me reinitialize re the value of the function, the number of the sampling point to be smaller so that we actually don't have to deal with the uh, calculation taking uh, this amount of time and uh, rerun these modules. So now it should be considerably faster because uh, we basically reduce considerably the dimensionality of the problem. So this one, as you can see, is already done. So we get the simple Gaussian process predictions. Oops. OK, here. Yeah. I managed, uh, managed to break it somewhere. Ah, right, because uh, I kept the noise uh, higher. So let's return the noise where it, where it was. Uh, interesting. I actually didn't. Uh, I didn't try this one before. So anyway, uh, let's uh, rerun this uh, predictions. So this one uh, still works remarkably well. Uh, you will see that. Let's see what happens with the. Uh, so this one is still for the high noise. So let's see what happens uh, in this case. Uh -huh. yep. So it tried to fit it by the two linear functions. And you can actually see that uh, this is kind of beautiful because given this data, I would say that the jump is here. And then this is uh, two linear segments, except that the Gaussian process part of it allows it to be a, uh, something that is also tries to balance the physics and data at the same time. So anyway, uh, we can also visualize the... Uh, oops. Ah, right. Uh, I haven't done this. Uh, we can also visualize the uh, uh, posterior distributions uh, once uh, we calculate them. Uh, one second. So this is our function. This is we get parameters. Uh, this is our posterior distribution. So make sure that if you create the posterior distribution, you choose the right uh, parameter values, because uh, if they're not defined, then it would be unhappy. And uh, the idea is that we interpret them exactly the same way as we did with the 
normal Bayesian inference. Now the question is, uh, can we take uh, this uh, approach and make it a part uh, of the active learning experiment? So what is the difference between active learning using the structured Gaussian process and uh, active learning using the uh, uh, using the uh, normal Gaussian process? So the active learning using the normal Gaussian process is based on the data only. So in this case, we use our data to create a surrogate model. Uh, we use this purely data-driven surrogate model and its uncertainty to navigate our parameter space. So in the active learning with the structured Gaussian process, we start with the probabilistic model of the physics of the phenomena. And when we run the active learning loop, we are doing two things. We are trying to learn our model better. So this is our physics discovery goal. And we try to run the active experiment in such a way as to uh, discover this physics better. So let's see how it works. So we are going to uh, run the same similar function. We are going to run the same uh, uh, active loop. So uh, uh, what I'm doing in this case is uh, I creating the copy of the initial observations. So if I run the another experiment, I kind of don't modify them. So then uh, I run the, uh, I now run this active learning in a loop. So I choose uh, to make six steps. That's my experimental budget. So notice that we always run the demos for the GPAX with a small number of experiments. The reason why we are doing it twofold, first of all, otherwise we would not be able to show it in the real time. It just takes forever or long enough for a uh, Zoom presentation. And secondly, the idea is that from the very beginning, GPAX is developed to work for the experimental situations. In experimental situations, our experimental budget is usually very small. So it's each sample is a day in the lab. Each sample is, uh, if it is electron microscopy or neutrons, is a day of preparation, days of the experimental work. So samples have price. And uh, this price is in terms of time and money. So if we develop the machine learning methods that can help to accelerate the experimental discovery, we need to respect the fact that the price of the experiments is actually very high and much higher than the price of the simulation. What we do need to do in order to reduce this price is to find a way to use the prior knowledge. So that's, that's the idea. And we also need to spend considerable amount of time running this type of simulations on the pre-acquired dummy data or simulators, because the better you tune your workflow before you even start to do the experiments. Uh, so, you know, it's a principle when I was uh, an undergraduate student, my advisor told me that sometimes an hour in the library, so that was before the electronic journals, so the hour in the library can spend you week, uh, can save you a week in the lab. So the same principle applies for the application of the machine learning for the uh, experimental problem. A day tuning the algorithm can save you two weeks worth of experiments. In fact, uh, sort of uh, some of uh, my colleagues uh, at UT have already kind of learned it. So that's absolutely true. So anyway, uh, what we are doing here is we uh, run the cycle when we run the model. So this is, we define the model, one dimensional, modern kernel, uh, mean function, uh, our piecewise prior on the mean function. We feed the model. So number of warmups, number of samples, number of chain uh, output. And uh, then we use the same acquisition function as we did last week. So in this uh, case, acquisition function is the maximum uncertainty, and we perform the measurement at the location where the uncertainty is maximum. So this is the example of the purely exploratory experiment. We don't try to optimize our function. We just try to explore it. So think about it as the uh, experiment where we seek to find the physical model or the behavior of the system over the parameter space, 
and we don't we are not interested in any specific behavior to optimize so this is how it is going to look like so we can monitor the process how our parameters change uh, betas kernel length scale kernel scale noise prior the position of the jump point so uh, you see how they get updated so it's fairly trivial to visualize this training process and uh, then after it has run we can uh, make the prediction using the newly discovered points and then we can visualize the progression of the experiment so the way that you read this plot is the following so this is the crosses are our seed points these are the locations where the initial measurements were taken the uh, circles are the exploratory steps so uh, the red curve is the model reconstruction and the sort of area around it is the model uncertainty so see how it happens it is clean and very pure experiment so the only parameter that was uncertain was the position of the jump therefore our active experiment started to run the experiment in such a way as to narrow down the uncertainty interval where the jump would be and basically it converged on the uh, this narrow interval so now let's see what will happen if we try to run uh, the same uh, type of active learning experiment using the wrong function so which is formed by the two linear segments not by two power law segments so I'm not running it in the interest of time and because uh, this is something that's really worth uh, doing on your own in detail. Uh, I'm just going to highlight the main elements of the code. Again, we start with the same uh, set of observations. That's why we save them. Uh, we initialize our discovery loop. So we run the model using the second function. And uh, again, we choose the, uh, we choose the, uh acquisition function to be the maximum uncertainty so we run the experiment we uh, run the prediction based on the fully trained model we visualize the results so look what happened in this case so in this case we actually managed to find our jump in the same way our prediction is not particularly correct it cannot be correct because we have the wrong model in this case. But even though the model is uh, wrong, it still managed to find the position of the jump because this is the maximum source of uncertainty in this system. So what uh, is very remarkable about transition from the static reconstructions to the active learning is that very often your uh, maximum unusual feature in the system becomes almost like a magnet that the reconstruction everywhere can be incorrect, but you find the behavior that you're looking for rather precisely. The only important thing is that uh, you cannot be greedy when you're doing it, because if you run the experiment in a very greedy regime, you just get trapped in some noise level in the local noise peak. If you try to be a, a kind of combine, um, if you try to combine the, uh, exploration exploitation things work much better so let's see if uh, this approach will work if i choose just uh, five points so it should be fairly fast in this case and uh, let's see how the process happens so first exploration step second exploration step so uh, the things to track is the value of the parameters and also the values of the r hat so r hat tells us whether the fit is good or not so ideally it should be one. As you can see that we started with the fit being relatively bad, so they are kind of not one, but then they start to become uh, much better with the experimental progression because we simply start to have more data. So we are going to run the experiment uh, six times. So for gun, two to go, for done, two to go. And uh, kind of while we are waiting, let's, uh, run the expiration for other models. So once we discuss it, we'll get back to it. Here we go. So expiration five. 
uh, now we are done with the six and uh, let's run the prediction. And let's look at the results. So absolutely beautiful. So notice that in this case, we knew the uh, functional form. We knew the uh, we were relatively flexible with the values of the parameters. And uh, notice that we have uh, again converged to the uh, uh, function discovery relatively fast. So our experimental budget is five initial points and the six experimental points. And you can see that the experimental budget has been spent one time here. So this is the measurement done somewhere in the middle in order to make sure that we are in the right location. But most of the experimental budget have been spent around localizing the jump. So, and uh, if you try to do the same thing with the interact function, the behavior is going to be different. So let's see uh, what is going to happen. So in this case, we wanted to run for nine iterations because kind of let's be a little bit more generous with the experimental budget. And uh, we'll see how the experiment uh, worked in that case. So going back to the question of uh, how the uh, experimental time or the number of points scales with the dimensionality of the parameter space. So we have two clear limits. So if we have a purely data-driven strategies, no matter what they are. If we don't know anything about the system, oh, we need to have the number of points which scales roughly with the dimensionality of the parameter space. It's just a standard dimensionality curse. If we don't have any connection from one point to another point, that's the price of it. Gaussian process will do better than the grid or random grid or Sobol or whatever, but it still does remarkably poorly. If we have some internal structure with the data, uh, we tend to focus on finding the manifold that defines the distribution of this data. This is what the deep learning methods are doing. So that's the only reason why they can operate. Pure Gaussian process will not do that. So uh, only the combination of Gaussian process with the uh, learn deep networks, the deep kernel learning, actually does this type of things. And we'll talk about it in three lectures from now. So uh, physics actually imposes a different type of structure. Physics says that there is a model that should work over the whole parameter space, and that basically reduces the number of uh, discovery points to almost linear in the dimensionality. So physics is much more efficient. The problem with the physics is that very often we don't know these laws. We can speculate what they can be, but in most cases, we don't know what they are. So uh, we have not explored it, and to be honest, we are not the right people to explore it, but it feels that in many cases, structured Gaussian processes will behave like a physical model, meaning that they are very favorable with respect to the number of measured points. Okay, and this is uh, the result, and in this case, the uh, algorithm actually didn't discover our jump, and you can see why because once we run the algorithm, it focused all the attention on the exploration of the uh, tails. So this segment and this segment, it looks like it tried to make the jump over here. It simply didn't spend any, any measurement time here and therefore this jump has not been discovered. So the way that we can convince it to work is to make a more narrow distribution, more narrow prior for the jump position, then it will work. So as the last, uh, so again, experiment with that because uh, in, this is the thing where hands-on experience and developing the intuition actually is really important. And now the final thing that I want to show is the uh, implementation of the Bayesian optimization with the structure GP. So the difference, bit, again, the difference between Bayesian optimization and the uh, active learning discovery is that the Discovery is when we try to minimize the uncertainty. So we take the next measurement and the point with the highest predictive uncertainty. Bayesian optimization is when we try to balance the prediction and uncertainty. 
So the way we are doing it is through the introduction of the acquisition function. So in this code, you have the three uh, functions. One is active. So one function is the same uh, maximum uncertainty as uh, before. So this is a purely discovery one. This is the upper confidence bound, the linear combination of the prediction and uncertainty with the uh, hyperparameter beta. So if beta is large, then you're looking for, you're trying to explore more. If beta is small, then you're being greedy. You want to go to the uh, pred maximum prediction. And then the expected uncertainty. So expected uncertainty, sorry, expected improvement. That one is a little bit more tricky, but this parameter psi makes the same, plays the same role as beta. So if you make it uh, large, then it goes for being more greedy. If you make it small, it being more exploratory. So the main cycle here is exactly the same. So you cal uh, make the prediction based some model, you calculate the acquisition function, you choose your next experimental point as the argmin of this acquisition function. We look for minimum. And uh, then we basically add the suggested point and run the measurement there. So let's look at the uh, set of the experiments. So uh, this is, uh, again, in the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to run it, but kind of play with that. So this is our uh posterior mean function this is our uncertainty and uh, this is our observations so look what happens so if we run the uh, model first time uh, it feels that the uh, function that we want to find next point we want to do the measurement is here which is kind of weird because it was argmin okay i'll we'll check it so uh, after that uh, it we recalculate uh, Let's see what happens here. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's actually let's run it. Uh, let's run it. So this is acquisition function. Uh, this is beta maximize uh, false. Okay, let's run and see what happens. So uh, the algorithm is set up that we can do the argmax and argmin depending on uh, our parameters. So this is our uh, posterior mean. This is our model uncertainty. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we are choosing the argmin of our acquisition function. So this is our first point where we want to do the measurement. So after we've done it, uh, we recalculate our function and uncertainty. Uh, so then we repeat the process, and uh, uh, interestingly, we can we are simply stuck on the edge of the curve. So in this case, we are clearly trapped in the local minima, so our process doesn't work very well. So let's uh, change our parameters in such a way that uh, we increase the exploration time. Trapped. So let's make the beta ten which is fairly large. So in this case, uh, our algorithm would be much more uh, exploratory in nature. So it's going to actually focus on the uh, exploration much more than on the exploitation. And uh, lo and behold, uh, now the minimum of the acquisition function happens somewhere here. So we are starting to explore the locations uh, close to the jump. So let's uh, keep going through the exercise. So now uh, we are stuck uh, in this location. So as you can see, uh, after that, we update our acquisition function and uh, uh, we uh, we as we continue it, we will be focusing more and more on this minimum. Notice, however, that this is not a true minimum. It's actually the metastable minimum. And one of the biggest tricks in running the 
structured Gaussian process is to let the algorithm first explore the parameter space in such a way as to avoid being trapped in the false minima. It actually happens uh, remarkably often, and uh, there are multiple strategies to deal with that. Uh, the one that uh, we have found to be most effective is the increase the number of the initial seeding points. Uh, and of course, increase your prior knowledge about the function. Okay, so this is uh, uh, kind of how the end result will look like. And then in the interest of time, let's look at the uh, same type of active learning with the partially correct function. So this is the sequence of the uh, predictions and the uh, acquisition functions. So you can see that uh, the progression in this case is uh, roughly the same. So in this case, it all got stuck in one location. Well, if it is stuck, then uh, if it is stuck, let's change the parameters a little bit. So we go to the initial prediction. Uh, this is our choose. We choose our acquisition function to be, uh, let's choose the maximize data to true. Let's choose the next point to be the arc max so that we are trying to find the function maximum. And let's see how it, go, how it is going to work in this case. So this is where we start. So this is our function. This is our acquisition function, which is, in this case, is fairly greedy. So in this case, this should be a simple problem because we just want to maximize it. And uh, it's not going to go anywhere wrong because it has already found the maximum. Interestingly, it's keeps uh, even starts to discover the jump more or less in the right place. Okay, let's try to do it one more time. Interrupt execution. So let's uh, set this to uh, so we need to have the hard max. Function maximum false. Let's try again. So this is uh, how you see the uh, basically the results of this operation. So the maximize uh, max and maximize uh, false and true means that we either take the mean plus uh, beta times the uncertainty versus uh, mean minus the uncertainty. If we want to find the maximum of the function, then we need to choose the arc max, uh, maximize true, and we choose the arc max. If we want to minimize, then we choose the maximize false and uh, then we choose the argmin. So we can experiment with it. And as you can see, in this case, we actually find the minimum relatively fast. So uh, it may be useful to uh, play with this uh, more uh, and uh, uh, play with it more. And uh, after, under some values of parameters, you can actually uh, make it converge to the false minimum versus the true minimum. So it takes quite a while. Uh, it takes uh, it uh, takes a little bit of time to figure out when it will go to which values of parameters. The important thing, however, is that when we while we run this type of experiment, the process can uh, focus on optimizing the function more so than actually discovering the true function behavior. So in some sense, it really doesn't care uh, 
about how our function behave, it basically goes greedily for the optimization of the function value. So uh, if we want, okay, should be almost done. In this case, we run the measurement with the nine, uh, nine iterations. So let's see uh, uh, how does the prediction are going to look like. And uh, let's uh, plot the results overall. So as you can see, in this case, uh, we provided some information about the uh, mean function, but the, when we wait, the way we run the active learning process, we basically tell our algorithm to find the minimum. And therefore, it spent most of the time exploring the part of the parameter space close to the true minimum of the system. And it really didn't uh, pay much attention or interest to the part of the functions which are correspond to the large values. So this is uh, the difference between the uh, optimization problem and the discovery problem. We can very easily uh, tune these behaviors by uh, varying the balance between the uh, exploration and exploitation. So through the choose of the uh, choice of the acquisition function, we can very easily uh, tune this behavior through the choice of the prior function. So if our probabilistic model is correct and and well defined, things tend to work better. If it is incorrect, then uh, we can get in the artificial minimum. But uh, generally, this is something to consider. So if you ever run the, uh, use the structure Gaussian process model in order to run the automated experiment, keep in mind that uh, you need to somehow balance the exploration and exploitation first. Another very important thing is that uh, when we run this uh, discovery loops, notice that uh, we tend to keep the parameters of the acquisition functions to be the same. So in other words, it's defined before the experiment, and then we see the progression of the experiment uh, kind of with the fixed parameters. So in some sense, uh, this is roughly equivalent of uh, uh, directing the car in one direction and uh, just pressing the acceleration. So you just go straight in one direction. Uh, if you're on the straight segment of the road, it will work reasonably well. If the road start to bend, it's not going to work. So one of the ways how we can intervene in the automated experiment is by having control over these parameters that control the ratio between exploration and exploitation. So one way we can do that is uh, we can... Uh, set some policies of how does the beta changes during the experiment. For example, in this cycle, I can take beta to be 10 in the first iteration, in the first cycle, nine in the second, eight in the first, second, third, and so on. So I start with the policy, which is very exploratory, and then I make it more and more and more exploitative. Another way I can do that is like if I run the real experiments, which are sort of slow, I can add the human intervention. And the human intervention would be essentially observing this type of process and making the decision how to change better on each step of the experiment. Uh, the key thing in this case becomes uh, what type of monitoring commands are available to human in order to make this type of intervention. And uh, that's something that we are going to talk in the lecture six, where I'm going to show the examples of the workflows with the human and the loop intervention. So this uh, being the case and uh, being almost on time, uh, let's uh, see if you have any questions and uh, see where we are with that. Uh, I have two questions like the, so if we like want to guide the, you know, like the, the process to take more moments um, around the, the fast jump, like the fast transition, 
should we use the the ei the expected uh, you know improvement as the expectation function uh this is the case where it, there is no uh there is no uh unique answer so as i mentioned the, there are three things first of all how well do you know the physics of the system mm -hmm. so if you know the physics of the system exceptionally well for example you use the based on the results of the x-ray or other scattering you know that there is only one phase transition and then the question is only its uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, it's one scenario if you don't know much about the system at all so there can be one phase transition or two phase transition or three phase transition then it's a different story so you need to put some estimates in the how likely are these scenarios I see. Secondly, you need to define the goal of your experiment. So what is that that you want to accomplish? So the automated experiment, when you want to find the position of the phase transition versus the experiment when you want to uh, determine the universality class, so the behavior of the physical parameter around it, would be slightly different. The experiment where you can go in... Uh, both directions in your axis for example you can change temperature both positively and negatively would be different than experiment where you can go in only in one direction so for example very often we can uh, change the temperature both ways although in some cases it is counterindicated but time for example we can change only in one direction right so it just mm -hmm. flows from uh, past to the future so these are the things that we need to define even before we think about the work about the workflow. Uh, and again, the trick here is to define them broadly enough so that uh, we are close to hundred percent certain that our priors cover the experimental eventualities. If it turns out that our system is uh, way off our chosen priors, things tend to happen really bad. So uh, the price for wrong prior knowledge in terms of the experimental budget is uh, very, very high. So we will eventually discover the true behavior, but it will take us a long time. So it's much better to have the mind of the baby or Jon Snow kind of not having uh, preconceived notions as opposed to having the wrong preconceived notions. Got so it, once yeah. we have that, we can uh, typically create some form of a uh, cheap model of our experimental behavior. And then we run our algorithms on these cheap models until we have a good sense of how they behave, what are the right values of the hyperparameters, uh, how sensitive the process is to the hyperparameters. It sounds like a lot of work. Practically, it takes maybe a day. However, if you think about the experiment on anything from the neutron reactor or even the synthesis in the lab or uh, STM, it's better to spend this day because then you are much more certain about what you are doing. Uh, my, my second question, question is, you know, like the, we are assuming like the normal distribution of the, of the noise here, right? But like the, in, for the, in, in the ex experiment, like the, around the phase transition, you probably have a like larger, uh, like noise because like the a small uh, fluctuation in temperature can cause a big you know change in your measurement. Yep. So will that uh, affect the the yeah process? Uh, it will affect the process a lot. So that's exceptional mm -hmm. question. Uh, there are ways to deal with that. So one way to deal with it is that you allow your noise to be the heteroscedastic, meaning that it can depend on where you are in the parameter space. Mm -hmm. So that's a data science approach. Uh, experimental approach uh, can be a little bit different. So imagine when you have the update of your Gaussian process, you have the learned noise and you have the learned mean function, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, currently we learn the noise from all the previous observations. Mm -hmm. But in principle, we can take the, if we run the experiment in such a way that uh, running multiple measurements in the same place of the parameter space is fast, but moving from one point of parameter space to another point of parameter space is slow. So, I mean, typical example, if you do something like Raman, right? Raman mm -hmm. is very, very fast and you get to the basically enough signal very rapidly. At the same time, if you move your 
spot from one point on the sample to another point of the sample through some mechanical system, it's slow. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing applies for measuring IV curves. Like IV curve measurement is relatively fast, movement is slow. In this case, we can run multiple point measurements at the same location. We can uh, get the noise from this measurement. And then we substitute, instead of using the learned noise prior, we can simply add the noise uh, posterior coming from the measurement. Got it. That's interesting, yeah. So this is actually, uh, this type of combined strategies, uh, they emerge only in the context of the domain applications because mm -hmm. uh, the number of ways the experiment can be structured is almost infinite. And very often our experimental setup follows our experimental procedures and follows the physics of the measurement. So the reason why, again, we are delving relatively deep into the principles of the of these methods is exactly to be able to come up with this type of uh, substitutes. So there is a beautiful uh, approach developed in the data science community. There is a very large number of ways we can deploy it for the real world problems. The way that we choose have to be chosen based on the experimental realities and the constraints of the physical tools that we have and our knowledge of the physics that we want to explore. Notice that, uh, as I mentioned several times, the pure Gaussian process, in my opinion, is almost useless. There are problems that it can be used for, like tuning the microscope or whatever. For most of the microscopy or physical experiment, it's too data intensive and too dumb. It just let's measure, let's take more data. That's not a smart strategy. Once we go to more refined methods like structure models, deep kernel learning, or the multi-fidelity measurements, the number of ways we can combine the predictions of the model as the way to guide the active experiment is actually incredibly uh, right, it's incredibly large. And the only way we can do that is if we have a very solid connection to the physical reality to actually uh, define our acquisition functions, interventions, and the general strategy for automated experiment. Thanks. Sounds good. OK, uh, this being said, uh, then uh, let's call it uh, uh, let's call it a day. So the next uh, lecture, we are going to talk about the two things. One is the structured Gaussian models. Sorry, not structured, the hypothesis learning is how do you combine uh, Gaussian uh, processes and some ideas from the reinforcement learning for physical discovery. And uh, we are going to see how to expand this method from one dimensional two examples to the two dimensions. So. As usual, uh, the recording would be on YouTube and uh, uh, play with the notebooks because only by playing with them and figuring out how they work, it is actually possible to uh, develop the intuition and be able to use them for real world applications. That said, uh, thank you for attendance and uh, talk to you next week. <laughs>